did you expect former Chief Justice Toll to be as aggressive? She was almost harder on Becky Hill than Dick Carpoolian was. She was harder. I expected a little bit more out of Dick with Becky. I think he was dancing around it a little bit and probably wasn't quite sure how much leeway Justice Toll was going to give him. But what you saw was her giving him tons of leeway. Mm -hmm. And I think that was her way of placating the defense and saying, I'm going to get it all out there. You mm -hmm. can embarrass her. You can question <laughs> her. You can point out inconsistencies and force her to tell the truth. Um, but I'm not, I'm not going to give you everything you want. She kind of was just kind of placating along so that it didn't seem like there was a cover up, that this is all out in the open. We're not going to you know, push anything under the rug. And I don't know how the public feels after all of this. Um, it was an interesting day. And I think everyone in the courtroom went through this you know, roller coaster of thinking, oh my gosh, you know, from Jer Jersey, like, okay, that's it. We're that's done. It. We don't need to talk about this anymore. Let's go home and get ready for a new trial. And then kind of went down again when Justice Toll, you know, had some remarks and how she was going to correct that juror's testimony and the affidavit that subsequently followed, followed it. Um, but then, you know, we were right back up there again when she took over questioning Becky Hill. So I think everyone is surprised. Um, I don't think it's over. I think she really laid, laid out the groundwork pretty clearly as far as this is going to the appellate court and they're going to have their own issues and a whole bunch of time to think about it and decide if they want to send it back down. Well, let's talk about the process moving forward. You'd mentioned uh, the appellate court and Justice Stoll obviously acknowledging that she knows where that's headed and yes. the attorneys for Murdoch just a moment ago made it clear that's exactly where they're going. So how does this process unfold from here? Obviously, we have, we're still in the middle of Alec Murdoch's appeal. It was put on hold to deal with the motion for a new right. trial, which has now been denied. But before we get back to the appeal itself, now the motion for the new trial, which has been denied, that's got to be appealed. Correct. So the justices, so they'll, there will be three justices that will be hearing this issue. So right now the appeal is stayed, um, and that's just like it's on pause until this issue is dealt with. So they can decide if they want to hear this specific set of issues relating to jury tampering like and speed it up the process and hear it by itself, or if they want to just say, let's clump all, because there are other appealable issues that Alex Murdoch has from his trial that have nothing to do with jury tampering. So they can also say, let's look at this case on a whole and look at all of the appealable issues at the same time. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what the court decides to do with that. Um, it's definitely not over, and I don't think people have gotten the like the right answer that they thought they were going to get after today. Some of the testimony came out, and you know, it just it's clear that things did not happen the way they were supposed to happen. Now, whether you know that leads to someone's guilt or innocence, that's what this is all about. Your 14th Amendment and your right to engage in this judicial system without improper influence is really the crux here. And I'm a little concerned that I think some rights were violated today, honestly. I, I, I was really moved by the questioning of Becky Hill, and I found her completely incredible. I mean, everything was not her fault. She wasn't there when that was happening or so-and-so did that. Um, I never did any of these things. And then really the, the critical part was when Justice Soule was reading from the record and Judge Newman said, I am not happy with the clerk of court questioning a juror before I did. And she just kept stumbling her feet over that one and saying, no, I did not. I did not have contact with these jurors. And I think it's undoubted that she did have inappropriate contact. And she might have just gotten saved by the bias not not rising, you know, but if, if we had looked at this under a Rimmer standard, we would have all been home at lunch. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Before we wouldn't have had to go. Exactly. Even to hear from Exactly. Her. Let me ask you this. We had one juror flat out state, Hill tampered, it impacted my decision. We had another juror validate what that juror said, but said it didn't impact their decision. And then we had obviously the third, the alternate, uh, validate everything that the other two said. Right. How is that not enough? I don't know. It was enough to me. Um, and again, I think like it, that was why I was a little disappointed to have Justice Toll kind of throw that in at the end that like while, while reading the record of the six week trial, she believed that the evidence supported the verdict. Um, and that's, you know, that's irrelevant. 
in this situation. Like, whether he is guilty or innocent has nothing to do with whether his due process rights were violated. And that is really where the focus should be. So that comment troubled you a little bit? I, I did. I found it unnecessary. Um, and also kind of like her own version of, like, I'm putting this to bed. And this is how I see it. And I can sleep with myself at night knowing that I personally feel like there was more than enough evidence to convict. So it was an interesting, you know, sharing of her personal opinion that I wasn't expecting her to put on the record at that point. Um, but Will that go into an appeal, you think? It could. I think it definitely could. It's going to be it's it's going to be interesting to see how things process out and what attorneys are going to come in on the appellate side. Dick and Jim might not be handling every single aspect of it. There's some people that specialize in appeals that they might want to bring in to make sure they've got everything right. And I think they had one sitting at their table today. I could be wrong, but just to make sure everything is getting checked because the Court of Appeals is just its own beast. It's a different animal. <laughs> it's a different right animal and it requires a lot of... Um, really technical thinking and lawyering. So there's definitely lawyers that specialize in appeals and I wouldn't be shocked if Mr. Murdoch brings one onto his team. So we obviously heard from former Justice Toll that the sides have about four days, I believe, to present their suggested language for the order that she's going to issue. I wanted to ask you about that forthcoming order. Were you, first of all, were you surprised she ruled from the bench? on this case, a case very complicated, obviously a ton of moving parts, but she literally took 15 Five minutes, minutes yeah. <laughs> uh, and had some remarks that it sounded like some of those remarks had been previously written. Right. Um, did that surprise you? Um, you know, I was really, we were chatting about it in the courtroom and I was kind of 50-50, it could go either way, but I thought that she was upset enough at Becky when she was questioning Miss Hill that that was going to kind of be the crux of we cannot allow a court reporter to not only do what she did, but then to come back into court and lie about it on under oath and, and dispute a written record that contradicts her testimony. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we're it's developing. We're not going to see the end of this anytime soon. You know what? It, and again, a little parallel here. If you remember in the trial itself, Creighton Waters had Alec Murdoch on the stand. Mm -hmm and sort of walked him into some lies that clearly the jury could see that Alec Murdoch was not telling the truth. It felt like that happened today, except with Becky Hill. Yes. Once again, and again, in this case, really walking herself into, into some lies. I agreed with you. I felt her credibility was completely lacking. I was shocked that even after determining that, we still ended up where we ended up because the Chief Justice, former Chief Justice rather, very clear that she found Hill to be lacking in fact called her uh what was it uh, 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 i wrote it down it was like a siren yeah, green-eyed siren, siren for money yeah the yeah. siren sound of fame um i mean yeah i when she when she was issuing her ruling and she said she found becky hill not to be credible i was kind of writing my notes like okay this is gonna go towards yeah. a new trial right um just because she because in saying that she found becky not credible but also not ordering a new trial she's essentially saying she doesn't believe jersey mm. And that was where this was all coming to, right? Their mm -hmm. word against Becky Hills. And mm -hmm. now we've learned that that's not even good enough because you can still not trust Becky Hill, but that doesn't mean you necessarily believe unequivocally what Jersey said. Federally, looking past, obviously we're in front of the Richland County Courthouse. This is a state court case. We're headed to the state court of appeals, then potentially the state Supreme Court. But there's another side of this. Yes. We've been talking about Rimmer. It's obviously a federal case. Yes. Do you envision a habeas corpus motion from Alec Murdoch at some point in the federal system after the state matter is adjudicated? It's always a possibility, but I would I would almost anticipate that after the state matter has gone through. Um, we'll see how that develops. I mean, he was convicted here. He also already has the other conviction for the financial crime. So he's going to have to resolve the state case first. Um, but yeah, we'll see. Well, Justice Toll was obviously defiant uh, when I believe it was Jim Griffin challenged her on her interpretation of Green, saying, I don't think that uh, Justice Kittredge said what you think he said. And she said, yes, he did. It was clear as a bell. Yes. Uh, she was very uh, feisty today. I think that was Dick, actually, was that it? made yeah. the comment about that. And she said, no, that's exactly what it says. Um, and she's not going to listen to a case from the 50s. <laughs> but she, let me, and let me ask you about her general temperament today and the way that she handled this courtroom. Obviously, a lot of folks have been critical of some of her rulings, but it's hard to argue that she was pretty tough on everybody yeah. in that courtroom, uh, particularly Dick Harpootlian, but you know, she gave Johnny Metters with the state uh, significant grief when he was 
appeared to be badgering one of the uh, witnesses for the defense. Right. What do you think of her temperament today? Um, I think she just stood out pretty evenly um, to everyone. I think um, Dick Harpootley and her maybe have some personal relationship where they can, you know, tag on each or you know pick on each other a little bit more than the other lawyers. But um, you know, even in the beginning when. Eric Bland and Dick were kind of going at it. She was like a kindergarten teacher and she was like, you sit in your seat and you move seats over there and I'm not going to hear it. This is not how the hearing is going to go. So it, it is funny, you know, being a woman and her being a woman in this industry that like no matter how far she succeeds in being, you know, the chief justice at times, she's still got to deal with, you know, grown men being little grown boys being in, baby, in a courthouse and bickering with each other. So um, she handled it really well, though. And I think she did everything she could. Um, but I don't think she could sleep at night with giving a new trial. So, I mean, that's really all we can ask of her is to take all of her knowledge and experience and years of expertise and put that into the applicable law and interpret it as she sees fit. Well, when we first started talking about this case, obviously you and I both were, I believe, of the expectation that things were trending to him getting a new trial. Right. And then obviously two weeks ago in this same courthouse at the status conference where she clearly narrowed the scope of this testimony, narrowed the scope um, of what she would be focused on in, in making her determination. It was obvious at that point that the, the, the mountain, it was a mountain now, not a hill yeah. for the defense to climb. I think when she outlined that she was going to be following Green and not Rimmer, that laid it pretty clear that it was a hill for the for the defense to overcome. Um, and I think they knew that. I think if you were to ask them earlier, they probably weren't really expecting a slam dunk on this. They were kind of grateful that they got a little bit more traction, I think, today than they anticipated, um, honestly. So I, in that sense, it definitely, you know, with Green and everything else, the way she put it, she did apply the facts to the law the way she interpreted it. You've been super generous with your time. I want to hit one more thing with you. but. Um, you mentioned earlier about letting Dick put all of it out there, all of the, the testimony that we heard, some of the exhibits that were put up, mm -hmm. the appeal for Alec Murdoch just got It got a lot, the record got a lot longer. And I think uh, Creighton got overruled like seven times in a row and he had some good objections, but she was, that was her way of saying, I'm going to let them get all these questions out. And then when Dick didn't go far enough, in her opinion, she took over and was like, okay, I've got some very specific questions relating to the record that you've just denied. Um, so I think if anything that gave Justice Toll hesitation today about her ruling, which I do think she had some, I think she wanted to be 100% convinced that it was going to be a denial. You thought there was hesitation. I think Becky Hill created some hesitation in the fact that she outright lied. And I think, I don't think Justice Toll expected the outright lie. You know, we and went she back expected and... expected Becky Hill to be more forthright? Well, either that or maybe plead the fifth. You know, we had gone back and forth about whether we thought she was going to invoke that or not. But to have her just, you know... She just lied. <laughs> she lied over and over and over again. Um, I think if any time there was a hesitation on Justice Holt, that was probably it because she's sitting there questioning her knowing this looks really bad. Like it looks bad to everybody that's watching. The whole world's watching. We've got another clerk of court coming up here saying this is how you do it. This is what you don't do. And then, you know, what Becky does. So I think if, if there was any hesitation in her, in her mind, it was when she was questioning Becky Hill. Um, the juror, that one, I just... That one threw me for a loop because as soon as she said, yes, it affected my verdict, I, I think my mouth, along with everyone yeah, else's, yeah. like just dropped. And I was like, that's it. That's all you need right there. Um, but according to Justice Soul, that's not all you need. <laughs> and I lied. I got one more question. I want you to just, you were obviously in that courtroom all day. Um, talk about that tension in the courtroom, the atmosphere that, you know, whether it was before her decision was announced, whether it was during some of the testimony, tell us about what it was like to be in that courtroom as all this was unfolding. It was interesting. You know, there was a mix of, you know, lawyers that are interested to see the process and what's going on. There were a lot of, you know, fans and people that were not fans, but um, people that followed the case and are curious about the outcome. Um, and so getting to talk to those people and see, you know, their input on some things. And, you know, a lot of people had varying opinions and a lot of people's opinions changed throughout the course of today, I think, um, with the evidence that was presented. So um, it was really cool to see, you know, bystanders. Usually when I'm in a courtroom, I'm dealing with other lawyers and you know different 
different stages of litigation versus, you know, bystanders and their sort of novice opinion, you know, that's what the jurors were. So it, that is, you know, priceless to kind of see what does the public think about this and how do they feel? Because this is an elected official that they elected into office too, you know, and she's still got a little bit of time on her, uh, <laughs> on her seat there. So I'm, I'm assuming someone will be challenging her though, however. Well, it seemed like three or four times during the breaks, you and I would come to, to come together like, what did we just see? Or we would just was... make eye contact and be like, what? So what was that? What was that? Um, but yeah, it was an interesting day, and I think the public got answers. They got to see into the minds of these jurors. They got to hear questions asked of Becky. They got to hear her answers, and then they they make their own deductions. Let me ask you this one. And I, I apologize. I keep saying it's the last question, <laughs> but your okay. you, your wisdom, I'm just so grateful for it. One of the things that you said that really struck me in our first conversation was about what the integrity of our system demanded and about how this entire process has cast South Carolina's already you know, badly broken judicial system in a, in a difficult light. Did what we witnessed today help or hurt public perception of judicial integrity here in the Palmetto State? I think it absolutely hurt it. Um, and I think it hurt it on its face is what we heard today. I think there's an opportunity to repair it. Um, and that's gonna come with, you know, Becky Hill could have gotten herself a perjury charge today. Um, what? are the consequences for her going to be? I think that's a lot of people's next question because, you know, we're sitting in a courtroom with a man who is convicted of murdering his wife and his son. And in some weird <laughs> universe, she was more hated than he was in that courtroom. So I think, you know, when you look at it that way, there's a lot of people that have a lot of opinions about what went right, what went wrong, and, you know, what her, I think everyone can agree though that she did not, you know, provide the integrity that is required in her office. And because of that, all of this has happened. So I think it's gonna take a lot for us to see what happens to Becky Hill. How do we make sure this never happens again, that there are clear rules and understandings and maybe better training? I don't know what needs to happen, but you know, it's never happened before. Um, so let's hope it doesn't happen again, but I think the public wants to see some accountability for her, from her and something to be done from this person that you know, has cost the state thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars at this point. And if the, if it had gone the other way, it would have been even more. You know, it could and it, still and it go still the could, other way. It still could go the other way. So she's certainly not off the hook in any sense. But I do think people are going to want someone to you know pin the tail on, and she's the easiest target at this point. Well, and you're down in Charleston, Lauren Taylor Law offices all over South Carolina. You're based in Charleston personally, yes. so we may be down there. We'll see Perfect. if that federal court case gets filed there or maybe over at the Perry Building uh, here in Columbia. We'll have to see where that case drops down the road, obviously, uh, after the state process is, is dealt with. But Lauren, I just want to thank you, uh, and I hope you'll come back because we didn't of even course. get into the law enforcement component of this, the prosecutorial yes. component of this. We've been focused solely on the judicial component. Right. But there's a lot about this that stinks. Oh, there's a lot. And there's still more, you know, Sandy Smith was in there today. So I know there's a lot of people, you know, there wasn't just one case with the Murdoffs. There were a lot and a lot of people have a vested interest in seeing justice done here. So it's, it, we're going to, we're going to have a lot to talk about. <laughs> well, your insights and analysis have been critical. We were relying on you heading into this thing for a frame and how this was going to go with the cases. Thank you so much. Of course. Lauren Taylor from Lauren Taylor Law, offices all across South Carolina, criminal, family law, Personal injury. Personal injury. <laughs> you name it, she does it and does it very well. Uh, Lauren, thanks for joining us. No problem. Thanks, Will.